hey, 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 good people. Grits or cream of wheat? Who the hell is racist? Does anyone ever ask could they touch your hair? <laughs> Woo. Black Like Me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G., a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, good people. Dr. Alex G. here. Hey, I want to thank you so much for being a part of Black Like Me, particularly at a very exciting time. And so um, today I'm going to introduce part two of, of a great episode. But before I do that, I have to announce two things. One is that we told you when we first started Patreon that once we reached $1,000 a month, we were going to create merchandise. Well, thanks a lot. You made me have to come good on that promise. And so we're going to be to develop. We're going to be creating um, merchandise. I'm really excited about it. Um, and so I'm glad that we're at this figure. So I'm excited about it. So please know we'll keep you posted. But we've got some exciting things that we're designing for our supporters because we think you'll be proud to 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 use it but it'll also help us to get the word out. So thank you all for helping us to get here. And so many of our new patrons are friends of yours. So keep telling people what you do. Don't forget, patrons, partners, allies, they educate, they donate, and they affiliate. Part of affiliating is you bring other people in. All right, so drum roll, please. We've got like 25 people. Thank you all so much, so much from the bottom of my heart for supporting this program because it just means we can keep doing um, better and better. So Don Schmidt, Doug Waddell, Amy Holland, Sean Lewis, uh, Luis, Susan Dahl, Dugan Sherbundy, Amelia um, Badil McConnell, Phil Evans, Alexis Matthews, Pete Maher, friend of mine from high school, Liz and Tim Mellon, Caitlin Lerdahl, Emma Jo Newman, um, Remy Kayo, Holly Harper, Denise West, Melanie Stefferson, Margie Swenson, hey, a friend of mine, Andy Quant, he, he fixes my bikes, Laura Keir, Brian Shields, Meredith Hamlin, Chuck Stone Cipher, a friend of our work for such a long time, and Christina Bernardo Kuhlberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you all. This is just such good, great news. And it makes my heart happy in such crazy times. Now, last week, we introduced um, a two, the first of a two-part series of a Zoom call that I had. Uh, a new acquaintance, a friend, his name is Dan Beltran, asked, Can we, hey, if I got 50 of my friends together, would you talk to us about what the next steps are in terms of anti-racism work? I said, sure, Dan, whatever. He shows up with 500 of his best friends. It was an incredible night. So last week we played the the more my, my presentation, what I wanted to say to this room. Part two is what the room wanted to ask me. So we want you to pull up a chair. We want you to sit down and listen to this. You might want to repost this, tweet it, write down some things that you're learning, because it's when our supporters are learning that they're more apt to tell others about the podcast. So listen to this. It's going to be a very enjoyable episode. <laughs> Take a listen. Always listen, lean in, learn, share. All right. Thank you. I actually, if we can start, because we did have a couple questions on this, but Patty or Maggie, if you are able to just recap the recording terms, just to make sure um, that everyone's clear on that. And I apologize that I don't know those in detail. Yeah, absolutely. So we are recording this. Um, presentation, but we will be sending it to the team now and it'll be updated and hopefully edited within the next couple of days. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. And one last thing really quick. I forgot to mention Samantha is we want to keep the conversations going. So with what I send out, we're going to ask you keep the discussions going on social media. What did you learn tonight? What actions did you do? What actions are you thinking of doing? What questions do you have? And then just do a hashtag lean into allyship. We don't want the conversation tonight to end. We want this to be something between now and the next event that keeps us going in our communities to continue increasing the impact of what, what we're trying to do here. So yeah. forgot to mention that. Um, and then Samantha, we can go with the next question. 
Okay, perfect. So then we had many, many questions around resources, right? And how to, um, kind of where to go from here and what steps to take. So I know you have touched on that. So I, again, just wanted to revisit around education, um, donating and affiliating, right? Yeah. Like those follow-ups will be coming. Um, if there's anything you wanted to add now, that's great. Otherwise we can just kind of address all of those now and let you know that we will be providing a list of resources and specific follow-up on that because that was definitely a heavy theme. Definitely, for the sake of time, Definitely, if people will look out for that e for that um, follow up email. Daniel, will that will that be going out later tonight or tomorrow or how soon? Um, so I'll be working with your staff after this um, to be just compiling everything. I'm still waiting on something, so I would hope within the next 24 hours. Um, great. That's the goal. We're just gonna see how make sure we. That, can that'll be that'll be really great. And I just it, you know again I'll just say this. This will just be a shameless plug. If you go to nehemiah.org, um, that's n e h e m i a h dot org. There's a button that says join the struggle. And there's just so many resources that are there. Daniel mentioned the event that's sponsored by the Urban League and Boys and Girls Club. That's going to be an all-star lineup. That's a way of really educating yourselves. But the reason why I pushed our site is because there's so many things you can read, watch, and engage in. Um, you, and you all, it's like any other kind of relationship. You can't just meet someone and then be ready to spend the rest of your lives with them in five minutes. It really does take interacting with each other. An ally finds a way to interact. Much of the work that I do has been enabled and empowered by my non-Black allies, folks who are Asian American, Latino, white, who have said, we have a heart for what you're doing. We built a rapport and they have helped much of this to happen. So I, my work, this platform is a result of relationships with non-Black people. So I want you to know allyship really does work and it changes the world, but it's not an easy process. Thank you. Okay, so another heavy theme that we had was just all about having the talk and starting at, at home, which you had, uh, you know, referenced and, um, you know, challenged us with initially. Um, a specific question on that. So if we can dive into that any further, that would be fantastic. That's a question um, and something that I, you know, that I personally um, feel committed to doing and don't always know where to start or exactly what to say and how to say it. Um, we have a comment um, from Jamie and she says, as a white person, how do you have the conversation with the black and brown kids in your family that are being raised in a whiteness that does not include their main influences educating themselves on knowing the conversation must be different? Ooh. I was thinking that the question was going another way. So Samantha, just, just for clarification, this is Jamie's asking for African-American children in her family who are not being raised with um, awareness about their own cultural identity? It sounds that way, yes, yep. I have to just tell you, that breaks my heart. Um, I've done a lot of family counseling as a faith and religious, trained faith and religious leader. The results of what happens to individuals who experience that, it, it's, it's heart-wrenching. For me, the subtext seems to be, we can teach these kids some structure that black people couldn't, and if we could just put this in them, they'll be okay. Those children are often, in many cases, that, that's redundant. They're taught to be afraid of black people, don't associate with black people, they're different. Um, and the sad thing is, in this world today, when you're out at night, you have a hoodie on, Folks don't know that your mom and dad are white. Folks don't know that your family is white. Folks, I've talked to white friends who've adopted, who have not had the talk, and then the police will do something, a teacher will do and say something. They'll say, oh my gosh, I, I, they thought it would be different in the world. So I would say, it is not just enough, Jamie, to talk about the teaching of the kids, and don't just teach them slavery. I know they're not your children, Jamie. Please don't start with slavery. Start with the beauty of the culture and, and, and don't just let the black kids read it. Let their cousins and siblings read to understand the beauty of that, of that culture. Um, the other thing is the parents must have cross-cultural friends. The parents must, I'm comfortable with white people, not because I lived in Madison, because my mom had white people in our home. My mom had cross-cultural relationships. We can't eat at all white tables at home and then think our kids are gonna diversify the lunchroom. Let's stop that lie to ourselves. We don't do it at work. So why do we think an eight year old, an eighth grader will do it? So that the parents have got to understand the importance to their children to have those cross-cultural relationships or that child's gonna have a hard way because the black children will sense the distance 
and the white children will polarize them. Who are you? You're too white to be black, too black to be white. And they won't know how to navigate. And when they're no longer in that home, they still look black and they'll be treated that way. And they will have, they will just have, I'm not trying to paint such a dark thing. It's, it's not enough to just, in my opinion, to just do that cross-culturally and you do not build a bridge to those communities. That, I have just seen it do so much damage. So please, please, please build those relationships. Talk to those kids. But the parents need to start reading books and the whole family's got to come around, come around that kid and those children. It's just so important. We, we, that culture is there and they will not be completely whole human beings if somehow that's withheld because it's not good or not helpful to them. They need it to survive. And just to jump Great in, question. Here, Samantha, there was a, a question that had come in. And it was actually a question we didn't get to as well, which is how do we make sustainable change, Dr. Mm -hmm. G? So we've talked about, we've seen this happen. You know, this goes in cycles with the media, right? With Trayvon Martin and, and so sure. many others, right? Um, back to 2012. And then we start looking at Michael Brown and Tony Robinson here in Madison, Philando Castile. There's so many, and there's so many hundreds more. And then we, we get emotional and then we go back to our lives. And so, how do we make sure that this is sustainable moving forward um, and not just a point in time? Sure. It's a really great question. Mm -hmm. I think what has to happen is that individuals like you all, Patty, Maggie, Samantha, Dan, have to understand what this is costing you and your children, your future children. What, what's it costing people if we don't do this? Think about the folks who don't believe that global warming is real. By the time we wake up, what have we done to the ozone? What have we done? Then it's, isn't it too late to try to fix that? We can't just say, oops. We want to mulligan. This isn't freaking golf. We're talking about lives. And so if it's just someone else in their life and their misfortune, um, that's one thing. But if the white community and the non-black community, but specifically the white community doesn't understand the cost financially, the cost emotionally, and what we are bequeathing to the next generation of kids if we don't commit to a long game. A long game. I don't, I, have, I don't have to wait for the Santa Ana winds to set another forest fire in California to say, oh, global warming is real. And I'm not trying to go off on a political tangent about global warming, but I'm just saying, once you've lost it, you've lost it. Once waters are destroyed, they're messed up for a, long, for a whole generation. And so if we love our children and we love our country and I love my child and I love my country, I just don't love his actions. I want it to be what it can be. But if we, if we don't understand that the work of Nehemiah is to make a stronger Madison for all, we're not just trying to just build up black people. We believe that Madison can be great. While black people, while it's being said that this is the worst place in the country for us to live. We incarcerate more black men on a per capita basis than any place else in this country. Our black babies die of infant mortality. Our infant mortality rate for black children in places like Racine rivals that of third world countries at war. That is 80 miles east of us people. So if we don't think that that's going to have an impact on us and society, pulling black men out, putting them in prison when they should be in families and having children, if we don't realize the impact on society, emotionally, financially, psychologically, culturally, um, we won't really get involved. I've had well-meaning friends over the years say, you've got to write more articles like Justified. You've got to write a report or an article every year to keep it, uh, keep it in front of us. Listen, I care about the ozone. I live in Fitchburg. We're the world, we're the state leader, I'm told. We used to be in recycling. I'm not going to wait till the planet gets messed up to think, crap, I should have done stuff. I want to err on being wrong, so I'm going to, I'm going to recycle. I'm going to separate. I'm going to put my stuff. I'm going to try to do my part in making the world better. I'm going to speak to white allies and not knowing if people are listening to me and multitasking while they're watching something on television. But I'm going to do my part because I don't want to be said that they were a group of potentially a potential white folks who want to know what can we do speak for real to us and miss that opportunity because i understand that as frustrated and hurt and beleaguered as i am someone's got to talk to white folks to say someone knew that that man had a record in minneapolis and they still let him go out on the street somebody knew how that man felt about um black people somebody understood that stuff but nobody said anything king dr king talked about it wasn't the racist that guy is one guy, and there's a lot like him, but we can kind of find those out. Somebody will say, I knew it. What's really smug smothering the work, Dan, Samantha, others, is the good white people who are silent and who aren't asking questions in the HR department, who are just saying, what do you mean we can't find people? Aren't there black folks in this community who could refer people? 
And it's not their job to be headhunters. Can we contract black people to find black people? See, you start getting white people asking those questions. Why don't we celebrate Black History Month at our school? Why are there no books by black authors? Why are only the black kids reading black books? See, once white people begin to ask questions, it changes the stuff. So black people have been asking white colleagues, speak up, speak up. When that news incident happened um, at Camp Randall, I put a call out to my JA circle and I said, black people, we know, they know what we're gonna do. They, we're gonna get pissed, they're gonna come to Urban League and they're gonna bring all their black people. They're gonna say, we're sorry, we're sorry. So I asked my white colleagues who graduated from Wisconsin, I need white alumni. They fired the chancellor up, they fired Barry Alvarez up. The chancellor put up, you know, just an auto response, we got your email, we got your email, you got your email. But like within a few, like within a few days, I'm getting a phone call from the chancellor. Sounds like you wanna to talk to me. Black people do that all the time, but when white alumni started saying, I'm ashamed, I have three degrees from Wisconsin, I wish I could give them back. Do you understand the level of shame that puts on a university? Because they expect black people ain't never happy anyway, so they're gonna be pissed about something. Even if we give them February, they're complaining because it's the coldest and shortest month. They're never happy. But when our white allies are saying the same thing, it shook stuff up. Your voice matters, and you know it does. You're, that's the personal power people have. That's the power that privilege has given you. That if you stop and say, this is wrong, that we must stop and take this seriously because now this person is very upset. So the big piece of this is that we need people to understand you stay close to the issues and understand that unless we're committed, our grandparents thought that this was fixed. Our parents thought this was fixed. Black people are trying to tell us it's not fixed, it's not fixed, it's not fixed. So now all of this is happening. Tony Robinson was killed in Madison. We got all up in arms. Um, as a black person, I knew that that officer's dad was my daughter's pediatrician and saved her life when she was one pound. My daughter was born Thanksgiving weekend and was not due until March. Matt Kenny's dad saved my daughter's life. It was front page news when Lexi came home from the hospital. So as a black man, I had to call Matt Kenny's dad and say, how are you doing? Now I'm pissed at what he did, but I had to check on him because he helped save my daughter's life and although I'm pissed at what his son did, I needed to know what he as a dad was doing. As a black person, I'm always trying to think about white people, always trying to take care of black people. It's just ingrained in us, white people. We want to say stuff, but we want to hurt people's feelings. We want to say things, but we're afraid people are going to start crying. But we're always thinking about how we bring white people in, how we build allyships. We don't think that that has returned a favor. If you take a look at civil rights, almost no one benefited from that work more than white women. And every group that was bridged to their rights because of the marching and the death and the maltreatment, treatment of black people, all those groups have grown and don't even know our history and don't even know that we help to open the doors for those kinds of discussions and that, that kind of freedom. And we just feel like we're out here and people think that we're criminals and they think that we're just lazy and we just want handouts. And so if we don't understand how convoluted this is, and if we don't commit to the long game, our kids are gonna inherit this problem with fewer skills, and we're gonna be seeing stuff like this in another 40, 50 years. I just don't think we can afford it. I just don't think we can. Absolutely. Um, we do have a question related to that. Um, and they write, as a black person, how can I healthily engage and respond with my well-meaning white associates and friends without being exhausted with the heaviness? You can. So you have to know who really gets it. You have, you have to know that. So I would say for black people, take care of yourself. And I, so Samantha, please know that I'm not saying you can't help people. I'm just saying you can't help people without exhaustion. Mm -hmm. um, because like I'm getting calls from white people I haven't seen since high school who are saying, let's go back to the place where race didn't matter. Like, who, said it, who said it didn't matter? I graduated from West High School, 500 students. I'm one of eight black students. I did not have a single black male teacher. I didn't have a single white, I didn't have a single black male or female teacher in four years. Who said it didn't matter? So when you try to explain that to people who say to me at reunions, because they've been reading the papers and I'm kind of into this race stuff, 
but Alex, we didn't see race. Gosh, we just saw you as the funny guy, the track captain, the good runner. So I have to explain, if I choose to, what that was like. So I would just say, what you got to do with your friends is find the folks who are really sincere. If you say, go read this, go check this out, and they come back and say, I did, can we process it? That's a really good litmus test. Um, because there are people who really are sincere, and if you keep getting frustrated with folks, you don't have the energy for the people who really mean it. I also say just use that gut, that mother wit that your mom and grandmother and people had. Um, you know, I don't know Dan a lot, but there's something about him that seems sincere. There was a comment he made on Twitter that made me think this is someone I want to connect with. I want to see how he's going to respond. And he followed up and he responded and did what he said he was going to do. Read, we supposed to read, introduce me to who's supposed to introduce me to. So then we took another step. I couldn't do this work without white allies supporting and talking about the history class. I, I'm telling you, white allies can turn things upside down. Samantha, in the, in the 50s, when lunch counters were segregated, it was white women in North Carolina who came and sat with black men and women. They didn't know them. They, this was North Carolina in the 50s. They sat with them on the lunch counters and said, if you're going to throw hot coffee on college students, you're going to throw it on us too. And they did. They threw scalding coffee on white women. Eventually, white men came because the white women were there. White women um, were told that they would be expelled, that they were caught protesting. They risked having to tell their mothers and fathers that as a woman in the 50s, they threw their education away. News cameras caught white women being scalded, sitting next to black men and women. Within nine months, 54 cities changed their rules about segregation at the lunch counters because white women came and sat with black folks. That ought to make white women pissed at what Amy Cooper said. They shouldn't even wait for black men, black women to say something. They should be, oh, hell no. You're not going to set us back because we sat with our black brothers and sisters. But because history doesn't tell you that, when you hear race relations, the immediate response is, oh, I'm guilty, oh, I'm white, oh, I'm not the man, but I'm the woman, you know, which is, and don't even know the history, don't even know how to ask each other. So what does it look like for us to sit at the lunch counter now? Because that got media's attention. It wasn't that women, white women fixed it, but white women did something that their parents didn't do. They did something that their professors didn't do. Hell, they did something their pastors didn't do. They sat next to black people in the colored section at the Woolworth. And America saw them getting scalded. She used that strength and that power in her body to stand as an ally. Allies got scalded. Allies stand with you. It changed it. 54 cities. It's history. Read it. Check it. And so we haven't even empowered white women to understand you have been helpful in the struggle. Because somewhere I think those white women said, you know, if they do that to them, they're going to do it to us. And it was right. Even the women's suffrage movement came out of the abolition, the, the slavery abolition movement. White women like Susan B. Anthony learned strategies of, of resistance from what Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman were doing with black, with black people in terms of, um, because they were fighting for women's rights and stuff. So even the history that white women have not learned, the role they played in civil rights, a very pivotal role, I just think it's wrong. Why not teach white women that? Because it would make them feel like we have a history of doing right. So now white women are afraid, do I have a place? Am I racist? Am I too white to help? Now there's all this fear. In the 50s, those white women walked off that campus and sat at that counter and said, do to me what you got to, but this is wrong. If you knew that that was in your history and no one told them to do it, the black people didn't say, hey, over there at that all woman college, bring your white self over here. They saw injustice and they said, we know what injustice feels like and came and said, nobody told them. They said, let's go. But if we don't teach that, we don't even give white women a chance to understand you've shaped history before, you'll do it again. And we need it and we welcome you into that space. So I think to my friend that's saying that, helping white people to understand the good part of history as well empowers people to do more and take more risks today but guard yourself because you can't do that with everyone so send them to history classes send them to read stuff and the ones who are following through build the rapport because you need to understand that when this stuff goes on i've got real friends who are non-black real friends who are white so i can't say all white people because i know folks who are not like that so we have to have those bridges but i have friends who will educate themselves because i can't be your friend and educate you because that is exhausting and so if you're exhausted you're probably trying to do both let people educate themselves and then y'all go out for, you know, a walk or dinner or lunch or something. 
Thank you. I know I can speak for Dan and I definitely, we, we acknowledge that we are so sincerely grateful that you have invested your time and your education and your resources in us today. And we don't take that lightly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, a question that also came in a little bit relating to this would be um, in response to the question about the exhaustion, right? And just and offering the education and the time and the resources and um, investing in white people so that we can do and be better um, for those of us who are in non who are non minority. Is this the right time to stop talking, pause and listen today, of course, being blackout Tuesday. Um, I think that there is, you know, people are torn between do you keep talking? Um, you know, do you keep committing yourself to, you know, be a part of the change and to move forward and grow and learn and be better? Um, or, or do we just stop and do we shut up and do we listen and learn? And, you know, what is the fine line there? Samantha, I think, I think we do all of those and then we act where it's appropriate. I think we have to trust our hearts and act. Mm -hmm. So let's just say if it's a blackout Tuesday, white people can do that. Something, I mean, there's just so much fear, like, okay, should I not be doing this? Like, should I put an, should I white out? Like, should I put an all white square up? Like, I think there gets to be so much fear. Um, so I think what I would say to folks is, you can never please everyone, but if your heart is sincere, that's what's really important. So I think like there's gonna be a blackout um, on someday in July about blacks not shopping. I think white people could say in solidarity with my black brothers and sisters, I'm not buying online either. Like those are things that are happening that people will come to say to people, well, that's not enough. That's not sincere. You know what, what are you doing? This is something I can do today. And so mm -hmm. I think understanding that a real stand is a real stand. Nothing's going to be perfect. I'm black. And there's some things I said we should do. It hasn't worked out the way I wanted it to, but I get up the next day and I still engage. And if I've got people that I can bounce things off of, I can say, how does this sound? What do you think? If you built relationships and you're saying, is it okay for me to buy blackout? Can I listen to Defending Black Girl? Can I buy a mug that says black like me? Can I wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt? Can I put a sign on? Yeah, if you know somebody black. Like don't do that stuff and then you're scared to talk to black people. But if you're trying to, to show your friends through subtle things that I'm shifting my thinking about this, I think that's very important. And I think whatever efforts, however clumsily they, 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 are, they are perceived, if they come out of a place of education, donation, affiliation, let them criticize you because at least you've done something. It has been the silence of well-intentioned people, not the missteps of good people that have gotten us to this point. So I wanna really liberate um, my brothers and sisters who are white or non-black, take steps. Take, take, you know, take, and listen, as long as people are acting and reading and doing this stuff, Dan's asking, I'll show up and do coaching. This is part of this is part of my work. It took a while for people to understand that they thought because my the, my movement was called Justified Anger that I was just about supporting Black people. And I do my programs, housing, mass incarceration work, criminal justice work. It's largely serving. Nehemiah has one program site that really serves African American folks. But if I don't work with the allies that are still judges, police officers, teachers, professors, etc., it's like training people to use an abacus. And there are no jobs for advocates. You, you know, accountants aren't using that anymore. They're using something else. So I feel that I, having been raised in Madison, I can talk to my community. But because white folks are Madisonian, that's my community too. And I can train folks to begin to make a difference. You and Dan opened the door for me to talk to almost 400 people that I would not normally have access to. That's a major step. And they're listening and thinking. So to the extent that folks are willing to take steps and even ask clumsy questions, I'm willing to meet with folks because I am finding that some of my friends who are white who are saying, we never felt invited in. And part of that is folks have said, this is what we're gonna do. Many of my white professionals will be like, okay, this is what we're gonna do in terms of what happened with Tony Robinson, what happened with George Floyd, this is what needs to happen, without even asking black people what they need. So I think part of the invitation is that people have not waited for it, or maybe we didn't offer it. Somehow we've missed each other. But in this moment, I think there's time to give folks grace. If we didn't step up before, if we didn't step in before, Let's start brand new. But for folks who are trying to figure out the next steps, as, willing as, they're, as long as they're willing to do things that we're putting out to them, I'm willing to either coach those that are coaching them or do some coaching for them. Because unless the broader part of Madison says enough is enough, mm -hmm. it, won't really, it won't really change. And so that's why I'm spending time working with folks who want to be white allies, because we can state our cause, but we don't have enough positional power to really bring about change 
And when white people start complaining about foundations not giving as much to black communities as they do to others, when they start complaining about school districts, when they start complaining about dropout and not just see it as their as our problem, but the communities, change will really happen. So we we take allyship very seriously because this won't change without you all. Hey, this is Eli Steenledge, the engineer and editor of the Black Like Me podcast. And I just wanted to take a moment to tell you about Patreon, our service that lets you support the show. And we know that you all love the show and listen every week. And so if you want to keep supporting what we do, make sure you go to patreon.com slash black like me. It's never been easier to give to the show and support it. We have a new $2 level, which is cheaper than a cup of coffee. So go ahead and go over to the website, patreon.com slash black like me, and make sure you keep the content coming. And we've already started to do some new things that we're excited about because of the Patreon supporters that we have. So we're going to take you back to the show and back to Dr. G. But thanks for listening. And, and Dr. G, as you're talking about education, there was a question too that came in before this session, which is not only should we be educating ourselves, right? Uh, the question came in, what can teachers do to educate white, um, white students to be allies? So you talked about kids, right, being our future. So what can teachers be doing right now um, around this uh, topic? Um, teachers can really, I mean, teachers are, are human beings who are trained to educate but it doesn't mean that they didn't grow up with um, implicit bias. And so teachers have got to check their hearts as well. I'm still in touch with my third grade teacher. His name is Eric Lilliquist. He taught me at Leopold in third grade. Um, but he treated all students with such respect. I was new to the area. I'd grown up in an all black environment. I'd grown up, I was in third grade, in an all black environment. But there was a love he had for all students that made me feel that I could be smart. Um, but it's interesting when I got to high school, I would be told things like I'm a smart black kid. I'm a good looking black kid. I guess like if I were white, I'd be ugly or dumb, but just those qualifiers that made me think that people saw race first. Mr. Lilliquist wasn't, wasn't like that. And he brought out intelligence and he was there, but he gave me a room to really share. Cause I realized I kind of hidden that from my all black learning experiences a kid who went through Head Start Kindergarten in first grade. So I think teachers have got to take the history class. Teachers have got to read. Teachers have got to understand these things. I've talked to, to teachers and friends of teachers who have said, black kids have so much stress at home, I don't want to pressure them by trying to get them to turn their homework in on time or trying to do this. So by trying to be helpful, they lower the standard. Education has always been our way out. It has always been our way out so if black kids have got to thrive and be pushed anywhere it's got to be in, in education there's a lot of pressure on teachers they have larger classrooms mental health issues so many issues um, they inherit what parents don't deal with and so it's a wonder they're able to even do what they're able to do but i think we have assumed that people don't have these issues and they don't wrestle with it. When I was talking with a gentleman named Chad, who was a former police officer in Indiana, Minnesota, I asked him about the officer who killed um, George Floyd. He said, the profession makes you cynical. And so I said, why didn't anybody see that in the screening process? He said, I think the job made him that way. So wait, 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 hold it. No, no, no. There's a lot of people that have been in that job and they don't and wouldn't do that. But the sense that there really are no evil people because we don't know who the KKK is, so there really are no white races, there's no real check that people through their own experiences or lack of experiences have these perceptions. They have these, they have these perceptions, and if it's never challenged, and then all of a sudden you have your first black kid ever in your class, and you haven't wrestled with that, and so you have a difference about opinion, the difference of opinion about how they live, who their parents are, how they learn. Is their mom just gonna be mad if I say that Johnny's not reading, am I racist? Well, no, his score says he can't read. That's not racist. Uh, you're racist if you don't say something. But I think teachers have all this fear. So we're even doing work like this, Daniel, Samantha, with um, MTI, Madison Teachers Inc., with various school districts to help teachers really wrestle with this because teachers don't realize that that's in their heart until something happens and they think, I thought that but I didn't say anything. Or, or, or I, my colleague is in the Oregon school district 
and his son was called the N-word. His daughter is picked on. Stuff's being thrown at them. They're not racist. They're kids. And his question was, how, well, how often, how many times does my daughter have to be hit in the head with an object before it's then considered racist? Because let's get to that number. But teachers, when they came up as guests on my podcast, they were like, one lady said, my husband's a teacher at that school. He never mentioned that to me at home. So teachers didn't talk about it. They didn't talk about the issues. There was the silence. They're good people. You don't want to be a bad teacher. You don't want to try to bring up race. It's just kids being, and I just think teachers, social workers, doctors, judges who don't have those experiences, don't have those lenses, they have a very low base of what black normality is. And so they accept things. And so people have to do the work, check the implicit bias, do the work, um, or we can't move ahead. And I would say, I'm just, again, trying to watch time a little bit. Uh, Samantha, if you have one more question, yeah. I, I want to ask one that just came in. So two more questions to you, Dr. G. Sure. This is an inverse question, which is, is interesting. So is there something that white people shouldn't do? Are Dan, you stole come... my question, Dan. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, maybe this is the last question. There's a lot more that we'll be following I up on. I can definitely here. find another. Um, but sure. is there something that white people shouldn't be doing? And are there things that come across as overstepping or offensive? Let's first of all just just state that we all we we're all going to rub each other the wrong way because we're human beings. When our church was all black, there were people who got on my nerves. As we become diverse, like that didn't just start new problems because they're just relational things, differences that we rub up against each other. So I think I want to just first of all say we got to give each other some grace. That's just a real big part of this work. I'll raise the bar hard. I'll push people hard. I won't let them bullshit me. I'll say that's crap. You can't say that to me. Um, that's not right. Think through that. Um, and then come back. Um, but I think the big thing that whites shouldn't do is to assume that they know the solutions. Um, and this happens all the time in Madison. White leaders will get in a room of business leaders and they will try to fix a troubled neighborhood. And nobody in that room is black. Nobody in that room is poor. And so they're trying to fix something and then they're going to come back and put it out to folks. And if we don't respond and don't show up, like, <laughs> They don't care about their kids. They're intimidated by the schools. They're too busy to come to meetings. So don't set the agenda. Ask people, not what to do, but is there something I can do to be helpful? And if it's read, study, okay, I'll go do that. But I would say not assume that you know what to do. Don't assume that you're not a part of the problem or benefiting from the problem just because you never burned a cross or you've done something. If you have, don't have to give your children the talk. If you don't have to talk about um, some of these other unspoken things. If you don't have to worry about how you perceive work walking in the neighborhood at nighttime, those things are all part and parcel of white privilege. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just means the system is, is working. But if it's so, so a white person should not just say, well, I'm not a part of it. I'm not a racist. So I'm good. Let's go get the racist fixed. Don't assume that you're not connected and somehow because by being American and benefiting from this, there are just certain things that you've inherited. Um, I would also say don't, don't speak for black people. Don't listen to what a black person says and then go argue with another black person. Say, well, that's not true because Reverend G said that's not true. That makes black people, that makes black people mad. And, and I think don't feel like you've got to fight the really harsh racist. I think like, like when I was having a discussion with, uh, with a colleague today and they said, oh, I wish this were recorded so I could play to my friend what you said. And I said, no, you don't need to, you don't have to be black or understand black, understand white and privileged. That's the best that you can do. Understand that. So don't, don't, don't absolve yourself from any responsibility because I'll never be black. I'll never understand it. So this is just heart wrenching and I'm just going to go home and, and not really think about it. Relate to the power structure and how it's been set up. And the fact that you can choose to not talk, to turn the channel, because you don't know anybody black, don't love anybody black, you don't work with anybody black, you don't play tennis with anybody, but you don't, you don't go to church with anybody or temple with anybody black, so you can turn it off and not even interact. Um, don't do that. Um, those are things that white people um, shouldn't do. And let someone else call you an ally. Let someone else call you up. Because when people arrive, it is not that people aren't allies, but when people arrive, they're no longer teachable. They begin to tell you how to do stuff and how to, you know, how to how to plan stuff and how to organize. And so I think that those are some things that I would say. But I, behind it, I would say, 
if people will humble themselves to learn the issues, to study, to educate, donate, assimilate, they can build relationships. They can become allies. They, they can become facilitators. Some of the close relationships I have built are with folks who have become our facilitators. They've helped us to market events. They've helped us to set up screenings. They're going to help us with our reentry conference. That I don't build cross-cultural relationships about talking, but by working together. It's why the military and sports teams have done a, such a good job of building cross-cultural relationships. They're not perfect, but because they have a common enemy. It's the outsider. It's 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 you know it's it's Michigan. It's not Wisconsin. It's Maryland. It's Rutgers. When you have a common enemy and you are not that enemy, you must lean in to each other. And by understanding that we're much, much, much better together is what's really important. And so um, I would say the last thing is don't think that this doesn't benefit you. Because as you look at State Street, Michigan Avenue in Chicago, and I would just want to say for folks who didn't ask, I don't condone destruction of property. I will say I do understand it. Now, not the census looting. They're just there are people out there just doing stupid stuff. But at some point, if you don't just when when that pain mounts, craziness happens. We don't know what made that officer want to kill that day. We don't know what made people just want to loot that day. Um, and so I'm not justifying that kind of stuff. But people are out their minds because while this is happening, COVID-19 is happening, then you got a president that's tear gassing people and then holding up the Bible. That's my profession. Now I'm really pissed because he's messed with my race and now my profession. Um, when it mounts, people just sort of lose their sense. I think we can still do this with peaceful protest. I, I think we can do things that, are, that, 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 that work and that are constructive, but I would just think, don't avoid thinking that this somehow touches you. And I don't mean by destruction coming to your neighborhoods, but it's damaging to your children to think because it's been unchecked, because society says you're smarter, you're prettier, you're more handsome, you're better, you're, you're more qualified to lead. That's going to cause problems. And our children are going to live in a much more diverse world than we do, which means the opportunity to clash is greater. And we just got to love that next generation enough to not let them inherit this crap. Hope that was helpful, Samantha. That was really helpful. And I guess a great lead into what my final question would be. Um, if we can dive a little further into the talk that you've talked about several times, right? And I know we've had multiple questions on that and I'm getting personal um, text messages from the mamas in my, in my inner circle um, and just any, any insights that you can share um, and, you know, just share your heart a little bit on what, what that talk looks like and if you were able to be in that room with us um, what you would hope that we would say well just know this Samantha at some point I would probably do this with a couple of my African-American sisters but if some offshoot of this can happen where white moms of young kids would like to have this discussion somewhat at length please know I'm available amazing for that yeah. um, mm -hmm. because we want people to do it I think it begins with our libraries I think just having a talk with the schools and say now what what diverse books are there? And not just books for black kids who are living, you know, in Harlem and they don't have a dad and the mom is there and it's all, you know, let's, let's get a mixture of it. My first book, my favorite, my daughter's a library um, grad student, student in the library sciences. And I wrote her one day, I said, honey, the most checked out book was called A Snowy Day. And she's like, we've talked about that in school. It's the most checked out book in Harlem in like over 125 years. I said, baby, that's my favorite book. My mom let me read. That's the first book I learned to read. But it wasn't until that came up on Google and I shared it with my daughter. So I got teary eyed because I realized it's the first book I remember that was, had a black kid in it. Salt and Pepper, Dick and Jane, they were white. They, were, they didn't look like kids in my class. They didn't look like kids on the west side of Chicago. They didn't look like kids on my street. I don't know who they were. But that little kid in that red outfit, I could identify him. And it wasn't about um, the white glistening snow stood in comparison to my dark skin. You know, it was just a kid doing what kids do. Um, reading that, because that's a book where the black kid is a star, but he's just being a kid. Have you ever taken your kids like to, to clinics, like when there's a little play area? This is when we used to be able to be in the same space with each other. Please let that happen again. <laughs> kids will play together, black, white, Asian, Latino. They don't see stuff. It's not until like third grade where people are like, oh, she's a girl, she's got cooties, or 
oh, your skin is dark. You look dirty. We start learning that. And then you have to ask yourself, where do kids get that? Where do they hear it? And so I think it's important to understand our children are not born with that innate ability to hate each other, that little kids will play, they'll hug. Like, it's just, I will watch them, you know, like when I would take my daughter when she was a baby, I would take her to those appointments and I would think, my heart is breaking because in eight years, they're not going to do that. They're not allowed to date each other. They're not allowed to celebrate each other's culture. They're going to go different ways. And, and just kind of having that flash forward is just sad. So I think having moms to understand with young kids, you can capture their hearts before they learn that. So I ran track. My mom would have track movie parties. My mom would be out there with a Super 8 camera in the 70s filming our meets that she would have my team over and would cook and do stuff. So it wasn't strange for my friends to be in a black person's home in the south side of Madison. Now, back in the day, people thought the south side of Madison was Inglewood, California, or, or, or something. But my mom made a point of making sure that my friends saw where I lived. You know what? Those friends had me in their homes. And 40 years later, many of us are still friends and kept connecting with each other. We know each other's children. So I would say to parents, ask librarians, like, where are the books that just that, that just the, 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 the protagonist is a black child. They're talking about discovering butterflies, things that little kids do. Um, I'll just push this. My sister is an artist. In fact, she's downtown today painting a mural on one of the wine shops downtown because they reached out to her. Now, it's pictures of black girls, but my sister grew up as a Barbie fanatic. And so when Chrissy, I think her name was, the black girl and then um, the teenager, it changed her world because dolls look like her. But every black child in my era grew up with white dolls, Baby That Away, um, Raggedy Ann, all of them, which sort of indicated that they weren't beautiful and they weren't thoughtful. White parents can get artwork, and that's not um, called, um, what's the word when you're, when you're taking over somebody's culture? That's not acculturation. That's that, like there, there's artwork so that kids begin to think. Well, there's a poster of someone who's black, and a poster of someone who's white, and a poster of someone, um, you know, maybe who, who's who's seeing impaired, a uh, visually impaired. Like that becomes normalized. Um, and now, because of things that are online, people can buy those blankets, they can buy those shower curtains, they can buy those rugs, where it begins to happen. So my sister's doing these shows. There will be white girls who will walk up to her table and see pictures of young girls, but their parents will steer them away because they're thinking, that's for, that's for black girls, that's not for you. White Barbie was for all the black girls. And so I think folks don't know that they can do those kinds of things, that they can read those kinds of books, that they can build relationships. So kids will take seriously what you read. They will learn to love who you love. You know, if I want, you know, I've had friends from different ethnic groups stay in our home. We stay in their home. So I've got friends who are white and, and Korean. And my daughter calls them Uncle Peter, Uncle John, Uncle Fred, Uncle Bill. Because in her mind, those are my brothers and their wives or their aunts. And, and, but when you model it, it becomes really normal. We shouldn't make it abnormal. It takes extra work. But I love these folks anyway. But my daughter's learning to do it as we're watching it. During the World Cup a couple of years ago, I took my daughter to Korea. Some of our Korean friends invited us to, for me to speak at an event. And my daughter said, Daddy, come here quick. You know, our people are playing. Our people are playing. So I thought it was like West Africa. I thought it was like, so I ran in there. And it was like South Korea. I was like, what? We just came back from Korea. My, she's like, these are my people. I said, Daddy, our people are playing today. They're playing on the World, they're playing in the world Cup today. And so I think we can, we can help that to not be weird for our, for our children, but it can't be weird for us. But our children are so teachable. And I think we want our children to be colorblind. And what we create is something that's not helpful. And we've been taught that. I don't blame white people for that. Somehow a generation, their generation taught them, don't see it. Like, mommy, look at that, but shh, don't say it. Like some of my white friends are like, okay, describe the person who's looking for me. Well, they were like 5'10", and like, and like, well, were they black? Were they white? Well, mm, uh, like it, it's almost a bad word. It's like, you know, this is not the curse of him. I love being black. Like, it's not bad if you, if you say that, but I think people are just so bad. Like, if I see difference, I might seem racist. You know, telling yourself you don't see a difference and appreciating what I bring to the table and exposing your children to it, that's racist. So anything we can do to help parents to understand how to get that artwork, how to read those books, talk to your school. You know, there are not enough black teachers in here. I need, you know, what are we going to do? And how do we bring this stuff to our, we're growing in a, in a pluralistic world and we're not preparing our kids to be world leaders if they think the whole world 
is white. That's not preparing a workforce and leaders, world leaders. They have to know, all of our children have to know how to interact. Black children, Latino children, Asian American children, they know how to interact in white culture. We do it and we come home and we code switch. White children don't know how to interact with us and they're gonna grow up to be the supervisors who are trying to hire and they don't have this experience or they're gonna be supervised by people of color and they're gonna be thinking, well, how did they get that job? Was that an affirmative action hire or what made them higher than me? So I think the best line of defense for all of this are white parents and how they just talk to their children about the reality of the world and how everyone is important. And let's not think that people are bad because they look different and then do whatever we can to put them in places where they learn culture, study culture, read culture, and interact with people from that culture. I, I implore parents, you can make a difference. My mom did a lot of things wrong, but exposing me to her white friends and making them feel like family, that helped me navigate Madison as a white, 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 white place as I, as I came here. Um, but I also had white friends whose parents taught their children to respect. And so I had really good experience. I might've had a few bad experiences, a few nutcases, um, and maybe there was ignorance because people didn't know anything about my culture, but I have always felt a level of acceptance as a person around many of my white friends, but I think someone helped them in that journey and they didn't just come upon that on their own. So I want to remind parents, there are a lot of good kids, children out there, just encourage them. Okay, thank you. And I know I know we are tight on time and we want to get oh. wrapped up. Um, <laughs> but I would love, if even if we can save this for the next conversation, um, I think that a large struggle around the talk and the way that maybe um, I was referencing it and some of like the mamas that I know and the parents that I talk to um, would be the talk around what's happening today, right? And the pervasive, persistent injustice and inequality. I think that struggle between not wanting to, you know, rob them of their innocence, you know, and ruin kind of their unawareness, but also understanding that that is, you know, that's perpetuating the lack of education and awareness. Um, but how do you with, you know, my daughter who's eight, how do, how do we sit down when she asks the question about what she's seeing and, you know, hearing, how do we, how do we talk through that? Um, and I know that, I know that's a larger topic as well. And we can I would put here, there are a lot of kids books that are written by Dr. King and some of the work that he's done. So I think that's a place to really start mm -hmm. and don't let the, the children might start talking about looting and fight like it's so easy to start there i was on a tv interview recently and someone said well what do you feel about this violence like do i look like i condone violence i said but your information is wrong there's been violence for 400 years let's talk mm -hmm. about the real the real violence um and so i just think there's a there are books and things that folks can google will help in other meetings to talk about what that looks like but just know there are really good books about Rosa Parks and Dr. King and people who tried to make the world fair for everybody. And although it's not good, sometimes when people become really upset, they do bad things. And we have to listen to people when they say that they're hurting. So I think really diverting that discussion from that. And I would even say to white people about their white friends who want to say, well, what about they're burning up their own community? So then what was the discussion before the looting started and the rioting started? Where, where were those same folks? Like, what were they blaming? They want to know, well, what did Floyd do to be arrested in the first place? It, well, there certainly wasn't anything that warranted death. So finding out how you want to do that. And Samantha, you and your friends are bringing up a very, very real thing about robbing people of their innocence. But folks, and that's what's so dangerous, that's what racism has done to you. Yeah. That's what white supremacy has done. Because when people, because that's the real battle. It's not like, I don't want my child not to know. I'm not going to, I don't want my child to be a racist. But you're wrestling with, innocence and that's so tough but my innocence was lost i understood race dynamics while i still believe that santa was real that bubble was burst for me in 1970 as a six-year-old and i still believed in santa claus until i was nine imagine what that does to a parent and 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 their and their innocence um but it helped me to somehow protect myself. Um, and in some ways, in that setting, it wasn't really necessary. But she couldn't not talk to me about it 
because she was dealing with it through a lens of a woman born in 1939 who watched all kinds of segregation. So she didn't want me to walk in unprepared. And so I just know white parents, and that black parents are ruining their kids um, in a sense by just having to explain, mommy, why did that man have his neck, his knee on that man? And it's, again, I'm not saying it's what you get because we're talking about it, but just the sense that for our white friends, it's innocence. For me, it's survival. If my parents didn't, if they didn't teach me that, the fear was um, I could die. So my generation was raised that by the time the lights came on, you better be on this front porch. When you go to Walgreens, you better get a receipt in the bag. Because if the white person says you stole, you end up in the back of a car and we might not see you anymore. Drive with 10 and two. For us, they only break our innocence because it may save our lives. For our white friends, it doesn't save their lives. Something else is at risk. And I totally get, I'm not even belittling that. I think that that question is so honest, but what we're wrestling with is innocence and survival. Our parents don't want to tell us either. Um, but the point is, the folks who mistreated us, the men that were shouting blood and soil, those things, either someone didn't have the talk or they didn't do it well. They thought that, they think, the Jewish people, black people, Latino people, immigrants are taking something from them. They think that this is theirs and if we just get in place, America will be great again when women couldn't vote, when black people couldn't vote, when we couldn't own property. Like this is actually a mantra of a president. Let's make America great again. Like we're only like 250 years old. When the hell are you talking about where were we great that we weren't stepping on someone's neck to make America a world power. We've always been a world, we've been a world power for a long time, but we haven't always been great because we have not loved all of those within our borders. That's the talk. That's through the talk that white moms have got to have with each other. Um, we're damned if we do and if we don't. If we have it, it's what we're doing. And if we don't, so a lot of people don't do it. It's like see no evil. And then kids are smart. They begin to say dark, TV, dangerous, and they begin to make all of that. And by the time parents decide to talk about it and build relationships and have a different bar for understanding what black normalcy is, those things are already built in their heads. And while we think we're quiet, everything then begins to confirm that. And then their kids begin to talk and then there are songs and things and it just gets so hard. So please, let's pick that up. Let's talk about it. I'd love to get some black moms in to talk about the talk um, because that's absolutely one of the best things that we can do because not letting that sense of pride and not pride, that's that we all need it, a privilege and supremacy set up inside us is the best thing we can do because trying to deprogram that is really hard. It's really hard. Well, I just wrote that down, Dr. G, as uh, where we can definitely start because that is, and thank you for, for still giving us that uh, much for, for that question. Um, and so I wrote that down to definitely um, start the discussion there next. And I want to take some time and thank you for your time. But more importantly, you, you know, we talked about being uncensored, speaking from the heart. Thank you for doing that. Sure. That is exactly what we needed to hear. And this is the kind of discussion our communities, not just Madison, all of the communities that are listening in. We still have almost 200 people who are still listening in, which is amazing. Right. Uh, this is what we needed to have talked about tonight. So. So thank you for that and making this so personable um, as well. Um, My pleasure. And so just a couple quick uh, logistical things. We, we definitely have more questions. We will get a, a summary of all of the questions we got today that we didn't get to. As a reminder, we are setting up a, a follow-up. Again, Dr. G was gracious enough to say, let's come back, right? Because it's all about driving action, not just talking. So in four weeks to five weeks, we'll come back, pick up those questions, talk about what you've applied, um, we will send out the resources in the next day or two, um, just a matter of how much we get that, um, how long it takes to get that done. And then just a reminder, there was another question that came in about a video. So if you joined a little late, we, we did record the session. We will work with uh, the teams behind the scenes to clean this up. It will be an available resource. Um, and, and I don't want to commit to a time, so that will be coming. Um, and then we are, like I said, if, if there's any volunteers that want to help with the next event. Samantha and others on the team really helped pull this together behind the scenes. This is not something that I just did. 
there was a lot of manpower behind this or power, I apologize, power behind this. And so if there's other volunteers that want to help, how do we start having small discussions with the groups and make this even more interactive? It's just going to take more people to help with these, these events. So let's just keep this going. And with that, unless there's something else, Dr. G or Samantha, we'll, uh, we'll adjourn. I will just, I will say this. <laughs> we're in this mode where there's so much that we're trying to communicate. There's so much of this that we want to put into a one minute video, a two minute video, a sort of snippet. So I'll just put it out there that one thing that we're always short on are folks who are really adept at editing and photography and culling the internet for information. So I just want to put that out there that there's so much more that I think we could flood the community with, but it comes faster than what we can do. So I, I just want to put that out there. I know you're going to say that as a resource of where you go to learn, but I'm saying for those that have that skill, that's one place where Nehemiah and our, our director of storytelling could really use some professional support because I think people are hungrier. I, I'll just say this. We broke our download for Black Like Me podcast today by um, 400 downloads and we didn't even advertise it because it's blackout the white community is saying we're not going to sleep on this we're not going to be on the wrong side of this we're looking for information so i feel that there's a responsibility of helping to create that content to help educate people and inspire them so please you dan has your email reach out to dan dan has shared with me but editors videographers photographers folks who understand just how do we use the digital platforms apps we want to really up our game to really touch more people. So please holler at us. And, and Dan will let you know all of our social media platforms too that you can follow us on. Yep, yep. And for anyone who's on here who, um, I mean, through Facebook, through Twitter, I will provide my email address uh, as well as a personal phone so you guys can reach out to me at any point. Um, we wanna make sure we can link everybody and keep the conversations going because that's the power of where this was just the start tonight. Definitely. So. I would say if I can just, follow up with Dr. G um, and his mention of his podcast, Black Like Me. If we, like so many of us, I know we're waiting on these resources. We're really excited to continue, you know, digging in and doing better. And I would say if you can start there, start there. I have learned so much and really, really appreciated the exposure and the education and the topics um, through your podcast. So definitely. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening, Samantha. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for offering. Ooh, black like me, yeah. I want to thank Corey Saffold for creating the music for this podcast, my podcast manager, Tyler Nyland, engineer and editor, Eli Steenlich, my editor, Jeremy Holliday, and a special thank you to WORT Studios, where we record Black Like Me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. Ooh,